think I was having a service all by myself. Um, those of you who've been very kindly texting, would you please text if you can see me? Um, I'd really appreciate that. Oh, it was a little hard to find a live stream and I think um, I just want to check that you can see me. Oh, Kim Kroger joined. Kim, I think Kim can see me at least. Are you online, Kim? Great, thank you. Well, I'd like to get started again. I am sorry. You know, um, one of the things I said at the very beginning, um, although it turned out I was just talking to myself, was there are great services being shared online at the moment. Oh, please try again. Please try again, Kate. Um, I've just got started. So anyhow, welcome. Welcome to worship, albeit a little bit late, um, here on the Wollaston Congregational Church Facebook page. Um, let me know if you're here. Let me hear, you know, you can see. Excellent. Um, thank you for all the coming in and letting me know that um, things weren't coming through as I had hoped. And um, so... We'll start over into this um, service of the word, prayers and reflections. I extend a wide open welcome to you, no matter where you are joining from. Hi, Lisa. Um, you don't need to be a member of the Wollaston Congregational Church to participate in this service together. Um, and one of the reasons why I think we've been having a little trouble is actually a good reason. I think very many churches are putting um, their services online at this time. And so we, we know that we're worshiping together with and that can be a comfort to us. So to continue our journey through Lent and the days of Holy Week, we're on the fourth, the fourth day of Holy Week. So Enter. Come into the story. Enter the place where you belong. Not belong, for this is your story. Enter the story. Hi, Deb. <laughs> Last supper, Holy Week, contains another important story that happens at dinner. Earlier in the week, Jesus and his gather for a meal, and a woman shows up unexpectedly to anoint Jesus in an extravagant show of devotion. To say she's caused quite a stir might be understating it a bit. We imagine ourselves in the room and we see the looks of judgment even out around us. Are we ourselves moved by her generosity and outpouring of emotion? Uncomfortable as Jesus refers to his own death. Does our complaining or anger really serve to hide our own fear? Jesus invites us to tell in remembrance of her. What uncomfortable stories are we called to tell in our time? Good morning, Jane. And so I invite you um, into our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. It's so hard to not be afraid. Sometimes our fear makes us less compassionate and more judgmental. We think getting hurt by holding back, unwilling to risk putting ourselves out there for the sake of love. Forgive us, O oh God, encourage us to extravagant acts of love, especially when we are frightened. You enter our story through Jesus. Now help us to enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now our assurance of pardon and grace. Know this, my friends, there is no limit on love. Love doesn't run out and you can start giving more of it any time. You are encouraged and freed and loved by a God who wants you to live fully. Let us enter the passion of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. And so our first reading is from the gospel. It's Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. While he was at Bethany, 
in the house of Simon the leper. Someone came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some who were there said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? Service for me. For you always have the poor with you and you can show them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body. Before. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. The story of the woman with the alabaster jar appears in all four Gospels. Usually that means that it was such an extraordinary that no one would forget. Not only that, Jesus makes a point to instruct those present to remember this woman. Alongside this story today, let us also speaks of extravagant love and presence in the midst of the valleys of the shadows of death. The story of anointing with oil goes back a long way. And in this psalm, the image of being bathed in oil is set at a table on which an over symbolizes the kind of love we are to emulate as children of God and disciples of Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no danger, because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full, it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. And so I invite you again to enter the story, enter the passion, enter the place we belong, not just looking on. Enter the story, enter the passion, enter his passion. And so now we come to the time of our sermon. I just have to find it again. I was in the middle of this sermon um, when I found out that it was going through. So I'm going to start over again. May we pray together. The words of my mouth and the meditations of be acceptable to you, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This week, we come to the fourth day of Holy Week in our series of Entering the Passion of Jesus. On the first day, we saw Jesus ride in Jerusalem on a donkey. We saw him overturn vendors' tables in the temple on the second day. And we saw him challenging religious leaders in the temple on the third day. The disciples have been seriously unsettled these past three days. The world has been turned upside down by these provocative actions in Jerusalem. I cannot help noticing that Jesus is drawing attention to himself. Both the Romans and the temple authorities are monitoring his ac actions. He is walking a dangerous path. The cross looms in his future. This is not the way that they want to go. They are relieved on the fourth day when they finally get an opportunity to relax and enjoy themselves. They go to the home of Simon the leper in Bethany for a lavish dinner. Today we read about this party in the Gospel of Mark. Mark's Gospel is not so much a story of wonders and miracles, it is more a story of failure. It's about the failure of the disciples to do the one 
thing Jesus wants them to do. Jesus wants the disciples to follow him on the way. The way is a literal way and also a way of being. The road to Jerusalem began months ago in the north, just outside the Roman city of Caesarea Philippi. Here Jesus began teaching the disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He warned them, if any want to become his followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. And we might wonder, does Jesus really expect that all the disciples will hang on crosses beside him? Does he really expect them to follow him to the death? Jesus gives two more warnings on the way to Jerusalem. Each prediction gives specifics of what will happen. Jesus is very clear. This is not the road to honor and glory, to victory and triumph. This is the road to humility and suffering. Even so, the disciples possess that amazing quality of denial. They are all along for the party of Jesus' intent entering Jerusalem during the holiday of Passover. And so today the disciples and the friends of Jesus are gathered at a table in Bethany. This is not a simple soup supper eaten at the kitchen table. They are reclining, Roman style. Delicious food is served. Wine is flowing. The men are privileged to eat together with Jesus. They are riveted to him and his teaching when a lone woman enters and breaks the mood. They don't know where she came from. They didn't see her coming. The noisy dinner conversation stops abruptly. As an uninvited guest, she has broken protocol. But that isn't all. She is carrying an elegant alabaster jar. As she opens it, a rich perfume fills the room. It's become clear. This is a jar of costly nard. And then most astonishing of all, she goes up to Jesus and leans gently over his place and pours all of it, all 300 denarii of it, over his head. She massages the oil into his hair and scalp, and the dinner guests are aghast. The jar of nard was worth a year's wages. It could have been sold, and the money could have been given to the poor. But Jesus is not aghast. He defends this unnamed woman, saying, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. He reminds them that the poor will always exist. It will always be their mission to care for them. But today, he says, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for his, its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Friends, these last few days, we may have felt a bit like the disciples in those first days in Jerusalem before the dinner party. Our worlds have been turned upside down. We are deeply unsettled. We have received instructions to remain at home, to seize contact with our friends. Our support systems have been taken under from us all at a time when we were anxious and stressed and in need of support. And we may wish we could make it all go away and get together and have a good supper in our social hall. We may, may very well be going through some of the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, and depression. Here at the church, we have been hearing from various organizations and building users, and we're particularly concerned for the recovery groups because their work is a literal lifeline to one another. We were glad to hear that they have been able to use internet tools like Zoom for virtual gatherings. And we're also concerned for our unhoused neighbors and poor neighbors as they are, and the already stressed organizations who provide services for them. A small team of congregants was able to put together 75 bagged lunches for Father Bill's place on Thursday. And we hope we will be able to continue to help in that way.
We are also concerned for our members and our neighbors who are elderly, who live alone and are unable to take advantage of virtual gatherings. Some don't have the necessary equipment or they can't cope with the technology. It's important that we all reach out with phone calls to our fellow church members and neighbors. When the news of the coronavirus pandemic first emerged, my husband was right on it. But I have to admit, I was reluctant to acknowledge the seriousness. I was saddened that the infection would claim so many lives in China and parts of Asia. I never thought that the virus would sweep around the globe and wreak the same devastation in Europe and the United States. Over the last week or so, I have been trying to accept the reality of the situation and learning what it means to social distance and stay at home. I'm fortunate I have my husband and daughters at home with me. And still I worry though, especially for my parents overseas and our son in a different state. When will we next see them again? Will they be okay in the meantime? What does all of this mean for our lives? There are many different reactions and responses to this new reality. There are beautiful videos from Italy in which apartment residents go out onto their balconies and make music together. And then there is the mom, dad and little girl who live across the street from us. Usually they're out at work and school all day. Daytime after lunch, sidewalk chalk or splashing in the puddles. Some people are panicked. They have already anxiously bought all the toilet paper. There are profiteers who bought hand sanitizer and face medical masks earlier and are now trying to price gouge. And there are the overworked and exhausted. Nurses, doctors, healthcare responders, grocery store employees to name just a few dated hourly paid employees who don't know when their next check will come. Did you hear the interview with Chef Ming Tsai of Blue Dragon Restaurant? He broke down and cried over the workers he had to let go. He considers each of them to be a member of his family. There is sadness, there is panic and calm, there is greed and there is anxiety. And there are many other feelings and responses besides. There's many responses among the disciple community to Jesus. Jesus praised the woman who busted into the dinner party at Bethany and poured nard over his head. He said that the story of what she had done would be told in remembrance of her. Jesus' response gives a clue to what he meant by telling the disciples to take up their cross and follow him. Jesus is not expecting all the disciples to be literally crucified with him. But at the same time, he wants them to remain with him. He wants them to accompany him, not only physically, but spiritually and emotionally. He wants them to be on the same page, in the same place as him. The guests who gathered for the dinner party that night have not reached the point of acceptance about what was to come. They are in denial. When the woman performs the action that confirms their deepest fears, they become angry. They don't want to hear this talk of anointing for burial. They make excuses that the perfume could have been sold for the poor, and all the while they are enjoying a lavish dinner. Jesus sets them straight. There are times for joy, times for mourning, times for preparation for burial. They are always to care for the poor, but today they are to face what is to come. They are to open their hearts to do what they can to care for him, just like the woman with the nod. Friends, in these days ahead, things will probably get harder. We'll have all sorts of emotional responses, including denial anger, sadness, and grief. But we do not have to do this alone. Together we can move our mindset to acceptance. We can get on the same page with one another, emotionally and spiritually. We can pray for one another, talk to one another on the phone, run errands for one another from a distance. We're feeling scared, 
We're feeling upset. Our whole world has been turned upside down. All Jesus asks is that we do what we can. May all God's people say, Amen. And so now we come into our time of prayer. Um, I invite you, if you want to, to add to um, the comments any prayers that you may have. Um, and especially when we come to the time of um, the people offering the prayers. Um, may we come together in a time of We remember today the extravagant love shown to Jesus and his invitation to remember this woman through our actions of loving others. For when we experience the valley of the shadow of death, we are called to be with one another. Especially at this time, we remember today those who are sick, are tending to the sick, caregivers, medical professionals, hospitals, first responders, all who provide us with the care and the safety we need. We give thanks for their selfless courage, pray for their comfort and safety. Now let us call to our mind's eye, perhaps with our eyes closed if you're comfortable in doing lives that need our advocacy, presence, and prayers. Those who are isolated and lonely, all those for whom home is not a safe place, especially at this time of being confined to home. Those who are unhoused and those who are addicted. And now I invite you to lift out loud in your own space, if you like, post in the comments the names or places that you would add to our prayers today. And now may we come into a time of silent prayer, trusting that God hopes the fears that we dare not speak out loud. Hear us now, O oh God as we pray in the silence. And now with Christians around the world and throughout the ages, may we say the prayer Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory of Amen. Now, I'm going to post um, a piece of music after I get off the video. It would have been our closing hymn, The Servant's Song. And so I invite you, um, as the video closes, to listen to that. And if it's, um, another Careful reflection by Steve Garner's Holmes called Present Shepherd, and it's a reflection. On one of the verses from Psalm 23 we heard earlier. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff at me. In this time. Certainty, we look with anxiety to the future, but the Good Shepherd leads into the present moment. Anxiety is an invader from the Shepherd of our has us courage and comfort in this moment. So the path into the present. The green pastures may be distant from this shadowed valley, but they are greater than you know. 
you fear the smallness of your vision. Meanwhile, the shepherd of our souls is here with us, leading us right now. Behold this till you see beauty. Stay till you know. It is not protection from the future, but the the darkest day of peace. Trust that peace. Follow that into this moment. Be present. Stop and breathe. And breathe again. No matter what happens in the future, God is here with you now. Be present. And may all God's people say, Amen. <laughs>